Hey, Profit First entrepreneurs and thought leaders. It's your favorite CPA, fractional CFO, Suzanne Morega. And um, I am back with another favorite oldie but goodie. And I like this particular episode because, you know, I feel like a lot of times in our society, everyone wants everything yesterday, right? They want the money, they want the results, they want the outcomes. But when it comes to doing the work, I don't know if there's a misunderstanding of the work that's involved, um, maybe not enough knowledge, maybe people aren't talking about their journeys of what they go through. But there's an unrealistic expectation that results should be entitled to everyone. And the reality is when you actually peel back the outliers, and when I say outliers, we're talking about the people that have reached incredible success. You know, outliers is a concept from statistics. You know, you guys may remember the bell-shaped curve. And in the middle of the curve, that's the average. And on the ends of the curve, those are the people that have gotten either terrible results, right? If they're on the bottom end of the curve, that bottom 5%, or they've got exceptional results. Those are on the top 5% of the curve. And, and I think that as business leaders, it's important not to study the average, right? Unless you are um, wanting to be average, but to really study the things that you want, which in a lot of cases is the outliers, right? It's the success stories. And if you examine those success stories, one of the things that you see is that those that have achieved incredible success have done the reps, right? They've done the work. They've done the practice sessions over and over again, and they have failed forward. And and I really love this episode because it's a great reminder that, you know what, it's about celebrating the journey. It's about embracing the hard times, celebrating the failures and learning from those. But even more importantly, sharing the stories that go with that. So I hope that you guys enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed creating it. And um, I look forward to seeing you guys in the new year. Embrace failure. Embrace failure because failure drops clues that are going to lead you to your successful outcomes. Today, what we're going to talk about is the reps. And one of the questions that I have for you is how many of you have played sports? One of the things that will happen is if you played sports is, especially if you played on a competitive level, one of the things that you probably realize is that nobody starts off being amazing, right? Nobody starts off the Michael Jordan level, right? I haven't met it. Even Michael Jordan will tell you he didn't start off as Michael Jordan, right? Everybody kind of works their way over time to become that level. And what happens is, you know, when you play sports, you get to that level because of practice, right? You practice, you invest that time. And what happens is when you practice and you have these practice sessions over a sustained period of time, what happens is over time, you build that strength, right? You build that strategy. And that's how athletes become really great at what they do. It's not the first day that they come on field that they're noticed for being absolutely amazing. It's practice sessions over and over again that really builds who they are. And the reality is the world knows very few overnight successes. So, you know, There's this theory out there that, you know, this person was an overnight success. The world knows very few of those. In fact, when you actually talk to most overnight successes, one of the things that they're going to tell you is that their overnight success was actually 10 years in the making, right? It took them 10 years to even build where they are today. And it was really just that nobody paid attention to them until they really mastered it is what they found. Now, you guys have been with me for a while. So you guys know one of my favorite authors in the world, besides Mike Michalowicz, is Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm wrote this amazing book here called The Outliers. Outliers is an interesting concept. Outlier is a statistical word. And what it means is that an outlier is something that falls outside of the norm, right? It falls outside of the medium. And what happens in statistics is, and you guys have probably seen that when you went to school and they were looking at grades and things like that, there's a bell-shaped curve, right? And in the middle of that bell-shaped curve is the median, right? And that medium is kind of like the average, meaning that half of the people to the right are exceeding the median, the other half are below the median, right? And the median in many cases means the norm. This is the norm. This is the average. This is the expected outcome, right? When you look at the bell-shaped curve, when you look at the middle. And 
on the opposite of that bell shaped curve is, so see if you look on the left of that curve, you know, it's absolutely horrible, right? When you're looking at the bottom of the curve, right? It's the ones that we don't want to happen again, right? It's usually the horrible incidents, the things that we don't want to repeat when we look to that left side of the curve. And these are ones that are typically not included in a study. They're tossed away, right? Something went wrong with the experiment on the bottom shape of the outlayers of the curve. Now, on the other hand, on the opposite side of the bell-shaped curve, right, on the right-hand side, these are the exceptional things, right? These are the things that are way beyond the norm, way above the average, right? These are the things that have exceeded expectation. And these are the things that we probably really should be looking at, right? One of the problems that happens in society is we always focus on the norm. We focus on the average. How did I do in respect to the average? When in fact, we should be looking at the outliers, the ones on the edge, right? Because we don't want to end up average. We want to exceed average expectations, right? And so we want to focus on the outliers. And again, I know you guys are readers out there, but this is a great book to read, Malcolm Gladwell Outliers. And today, what I want to do is I want to focus on the outliers. I want to focus on how can you achieve outlayer results with that. And so what I want to do is, you know, I got three points that I want to talk about today in detail. If you haven't grabbed your pencil, go ahead and grab your pencil because you're going to want to take some notes on this for this. So point number one, point number one is I want you to embrace failure. All right. I know it sounds weird, but I want you to embrace failure. And I found this really cool article and I'm going to share with you this article here. It was called The 15 Highly Successful People Who Failed Before Succeeding. And it's an article by Sebastian Kipman. But I found this article interesting because in his article, what he does, he talks about some people that people normally go, oh my gosh, this person's amazing. You know, they're an overnight success. They're genetically superior to everybody else. And what he does is he studies these people and he goes, you know what? They're really not, right? They're really not. And the first person that I found interesting in his article was Sir James Dyson. Sir James Dyson, you know, you guys may know him. He makes the amazing bagless vacuum cleaners. I don't know if you guys remember the old vacuum cleaners that you would get. I know I had one in college. You have this bag that you have to take out. And every time you took it out, you would dread it because all this dust would just flow into your face and all this dust would just blow into your face, right? And well, he created this bagless vacuum. And actually, I'm such a big fan of Dyson. I has actually had their Dyson hairdryer, right? But it took him 15 years to create this bagless vacuum cleaner. Now, this bag is not only 15 years, but it took him 5,000, over 5,000 prototypes. He literally failed 5,000 times in order to build this bagless vacuum cleaner. Now, today, you would never think that. He's got a net worth of over $4.5 billion. I'm not saying million, billion dollars, but he failed 15 years over 5,000 times. Now, you guys also probably know Steven Spielberg. Who doesn't know Steven Spielberg? He wrote one, not wrote, but he directed one of my favorite films. He directed The Color Purple, you know? Like I would literally sneak into like the watch Color Purple because I wasn't allowed when it came out. You know, my mom wouldn't let me watch it because of what it dealt with. But one of my all-time favorites, he also did E.T., right? And his films have grossed over $9 million. But it's interesting because he actually was rejected from the University of Southern California. And not just rejected, but he was rejected twice, literally twice. And because he struggled with dyslexia, school wasn't easy for him, right? And he went on to win 11 Emmy Awards. He won three Oscars, seven Globes, and he is one of the most successful directors of all times. And then you guys know Thomas Edison, right? Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light, right? The light bulb. So we don't have to stay in the dark ages, you know? And it's interesting because what his teachers told him, Thomas Edison was, he was too stupid to learn anything. Imagine how those teachers feel now rolling over in their grades or telling this brilliant man, you're too stupid to learn anything, right? And now Thomas Edison, he held over a thousand patents. He created the phonograph. He created the electric lamp, right? He got us out of the dark ages. Amazing man. But again, was told that he was too stupid to learn anything. How many of you guys have heard some bad things, you know, growing up about yourself, right? Walt Disney, Walt Disney, you know, uh, who doesn't love a Mickey Mouse? You know, I, I love a Mickey Mouse. But Walt Disney was told by his editor that he lacked imagination and had no good ideas. I'm like, what? No good ideas with Walt Disney? <laughs> and Walt Disney said, you know, I think it's important to have a good hard failure when you're young because it makes you kind of aware of what can happen to you because of it. I've never had any fear my whole life when we've been near collapse and all of that. I've never been afraid to embrace failure. Don't be afraid of failure. And then you guys know Albert Einstein, his wacky hair, right? (laughs) Um, 
Albert Einstein, he actually couldn't speak until he was four years old. He couldn't read until he was seven. And people thought he was mentally handicapped. And now we think of him as a genius. You know, I remember when my kids were little, I would actually buy baby Einstein for them, right? To help them kind of get ahead in life. And Einstein, you know, even though everybody thought that he was mentally handicapped, he went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize and he altered the world's approach to physics, right? Everybody knows Albert Einstein. And who doesn't like a Harry Potter book, right? Who doesn't like a Harry Potter? J.K. Rowling. Um, you know, J.K. Rowling, before she wrote Harry Potter, she was broke. <laughs> she was broke. She was depressed. She was a divorced single mother. In fact, publishers rejected her book, Harry Potter. And now she's one of the most wealthiest women in the world. And she said, it's impossible to live without failing at something unless you live so cautiously that you might as well have not have lived at all, in which case you fail by default is what she said. And then Abraham Lincoln, right? A president, the one that ended slavery, right? He actually ran for president several times before he became president, right? And he failed until he finally became one of the most celebrated presidents in the United States. And he shares the quote, my great concern is not whether you have failed, but whether you are content with your fail. You got to be happy, not happy necessarily, but content that failure is part of progression, right? You have to be content with that. And then Jerry Seinfeld, he is so funny, right? Who doesn't love a Jerry Seinfeld? You know, nobody knows this, but he actually froze on stage. You know, his audience booed him on the first time that he went out there. They booed him, right? And now he's like one of the most, you know, admired stand-up comedians out there. And then who doesn't love a Dr. Seuss, right? Who doesn't love a Dr. Seuss? Green eggs and hams or, you know, about who doesn't love Dr. Seuss? But his first book was rejected 27 times from publishers. He actually went home to burn his manuscript when he ran into a classmate that says, no, 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 we need to help you find a publisher, right? And now his books have sold over 600 million. He's been passed away, but we're still reading his books, right? Kids are still reading his books. Oprah Winfrey, right? Oprah Winfrey, a billionaire, and she's um she has her own TV channel, but she was fired from her first job, fired from her first job as an anchor woman for a TV station in Baltimore, right? And she says, there's no such thing as failure. Failure is just life trying to move us into another direction is what she says, right? It's just the wind blowing us to where we're supposed to be, right? And then Stephen King, who doesn't love a Stephen King scary movie, right? Stephen King, his first book was rejected 30 times. And literally, he literally went home to put his book into the trash and his wife picked it up, you know, and she resubmitted it for him. And now we know him as Stephen King, right? Because his wife picked his book out of the trash. Van Gogh, you know, his paintings now go for a hundred million dollars, right? Like we have to get like prints of his masterpiece. He couldn't sell one of those masterpieces when he was alive at all. And now, you know, he's remembered as one of the best artists in the world. You know, I remember studying him in third grade. Um, success, he says, is sometimes the outcome of a whole string of failures. It's the failures that make up success. And Elvis Presley, right? he just had a movie that came out about his life. And the first time that he performed at the Grand Ole Opry, he was fired. And now, I mean, like, I'm telling you, you can find an Elvis impersonator on every block on Vegas, right? And then there's Michael Jordan. And here's the thing about Michael Jordan. He was actually cut. He was cut from his high school basketball team. His coach missed the talent. They missed that he was the fact that he was going to be the greatest of all times, right? He was the go to basketball. And Michael Jordan says, you know, I have missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I have lost almost 300 games. On 26 occasions, I have been entrusted to make the winning shot and I missed I have failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. And the last one is Charles Darwin, right? Um, Whether you believe it or not, you know, Charles Darwin was an average student. You know, he actually left his profession in medicine and now he's known as, you know, the father of evolution for that. So again, you know, it's failure. Failure is part of who we are, right? Failure is how we build our way to success. And so my point is, embrace failure. Embrace failure because failure drops clues that are going to lead you to your successful outcomes. And I'm going to say that again, failure drops clues to lead you to your successful outcome. So let's start on point two. Point two is embrace the reps. And the reason why I named it embrace the reps is because I think people give up too soon, right? They give up too soon. And I think particularly about my experience with childbirth. And we're going to get a little intimate for, for you guys. You guys are going to learn a little bit more about me here. But um, if you've ever gone through childbirth or you know of someone that has, maybe your spouse has gone through it or your significant other, 
especially that first time, that first pregnancy, right? That first pregnancy, it's like a marathon, right? You don't know what's going to happen. It just hits you like a train, that first one. And for my daughter, you know, and actually for my son, I use it for both of my kids. I use a method called the Bradley method. And I don't know if there's anybody that's familiar with the Bradley method. I know we've got some folks here that are in the medical profession, but the Bradley method is an alternative to the Lamaze method, right? Everybody hears about Lamaze. That's that panting up <laughs> that you do, right? To get through labor. But Bradley method is actually the alternative to Lamaze method. And I highly recommend it. I did it on both of my children. But unlike the Lamaze method, the Bradley method is a natural childbirth method. So it's a drugless form of a childbirth method. So you don't take the epidural, you don't have drugs. It is literally a natural birth. And supposedly the benefits of doing the Bradley method of doing a natural birth is that it's healthier. It's healthier for the mom. It's healthier for the child. When the child is born, you know, they don't have the medications in their system. So they typically are more alert. Nursing for those that are breastfed, um, it tends to be more successful because the child is alert, the mom's alert, they're able to focus a little bit more on that. And so the bottle tends not to be introduced early on. And so that learning, because, you know, babies don't come out necessarily learning how to nurse, that have learned how to nurse, they have to be taught that. And also the other benefit is that healing is more rapid for the mother because, you know, there's less likely that you're going to be cut. And so that healing time is much faster because, you know, you're having more of a natural birth and the natural birth is really kind of the way that we were naturally intended to, to give birth. And if you can have that method, you know, definitely I highly recommend it. Some people are not able to have it for different medical situations, but if you are able to have it, I highly recommend it. But one of the things that happens in the Bradley method is instead of focusing on that rapid breathing, like Lamaze, like you've seen in the movies or have maybe seen a friend do Dr. Bradley, um, Robert Bradley, what he did was he's the founder of the Bradley method was he went and observed animals. And one of the things that he noticed was that animals, when they were giving birth, you know, they didn't have a lot of commotion. They didn't have the babies in some case with animals in the midst of a lot of other animals, right? What happened was they tended to go alone, right? They tended to go out into the wild, go away from the pack, and they were seeking tranquility is what they were, at, what they were doing. And they were seeking solitude in order to have this process happen for them. And what happened with these animals was they went away into that quiet corner of the barn or into that wilderness. One of the things that they experienced was their breathing actually started to slow down. They actually started to calm themselves down. It was a very calming event for them versus a very calamitous event. And hence the Bradley method was born. And what the Bradley method is, it's a combination of slow breathing. It's a combination of specific exercises, right? That you have to do. And it's a combination of education so that you know what to expect. You're not, you know, by the time you have a baby, it's not your first rodeo, your ex first exposure to it. And it's also a combination of meditation. And what happens is when you're going through these exercises, when you're going through this education and you're going through this meditation, you're learning how to think through the process. What's happening is you're starting to create a mental outcome before you even begin. You're starting to picture in your mind what this birth is going to be like. So there are no surprises. You're able to kind of enter into a calm place when you're doing this. But one of the things that happens when you're going through a childhood for any guys have ever gone through it or have a close friend or, or a spouse that has gone through it. One of the things that you'll find is that your peers and your doctors too will never tell you that you're almost there. <laughs> you know, they're never going to tell you this specific nugget of information I'm going to tell you today. And that nugget is just when you think you are done, just when you think you can't take this anymore, just when you think, can somebody please hit me on the head of a baseball bat, right? Just when you're ready to quit and throw in a towel and like, a bag for that epidural, one of the things that you won't realize is that you're actually almost there. You're actually almost there. And luckily with most successful Bradley method births, you know, once you're there, once you're at that point that you just can't manage the pain anymore, that it's absolutely horrible, right? It's often too late to even have an epidural administer ET, right? You've already dilated way too much. They can't help you anymore. The only way that you can do is carry on, right? And proceed with having this child naturally because you're beyond that point of no return. It's too late for the epidural. But I share the story with you because the interesting thing about a natural childbirth is you don't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to do a natural childbirth. Okay. You don't wake up and say, I got 20 hours to delivery. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to have this baby unprepared. Right. 
But what happens is, you know, if you're going to do a natural birth and you're going to do it Bradley method, you're going to attend several classes so that you know what to expect, right? And these are not one day classes. These are usually 10 week classes and they're pretty long classes. They got videos in there. They've got exercise in there. And this is a real investment of your time. And not only are you attending these classes, but your partner is also attending these classes with you, right? They're being educated as to what to expect. And the reason why your partner is also being educated is because they need to understand the process because the last thing your partner needs to be is in that birthing room with you and they're panicking, right? Because if your partner starts panicking, you're going to start panicking and suddenly you're going to be pressured to make a rash decision with that, right? So it's an education process. Not only is it an education process, but you're expected to create a written birth plan. And this is a written document, a very intensive written document and of what you're expecting for your birth to be like, what you're expecting it to be like, what your excess you want to be. Do you want to be able to walk around versus being confined to the bed? This is a very specific document. And you don't only bring this birth plan to the hospital the day that you deliver. Oh, no, no, no. You're going to bring this birth plan to your physician months in advance of the event, right? Because your physician needs to know that, hey, you're going to be doing this naturally and they're going to have to decide, do they want to support you on this? And this birth plan, when you actually bring it to your physician, when you bring it to the hospital, that's almost like a will, right? They're going to do their best to respect your wishes is what they're going to do. And your doctor, if you've ever done it, they're going to take this birth plan very, very seriously. And this birth plan includes, you know, your medical staff is going to be prohibited from doing. So if your birth plan says they are prohibited from even offering you an epidural, they're not going to offer you an epidural during your birthing session. In addition to this, you know, to do that, that natural birth, you have to be physically fit, right? To do a natural birth, right? Um, you can't be doing this if you're not physically fit. It takes a lot of physical energy. It takes a lot of strength to do a physical natural birth delivery here. And the exercises are part of this Bradley method. And they're exercises. You don't just do it the day of giving birth. You do this months in advance. You're literally practicing these exercises, right? And you've got to practice these exercises because you've got to be in the physical shape to have the best outcome for a natural birth. And these exercises are not necessarily easy. You're going to be doing squats. You're going to be lunging. You're going to be like pointing yourself against the wall during squats. And during the birthing process, when you're tired, when you're exhausted, when you are in pain, right? You're going to make very different decisions than on a happy day, right? Like today. And so you have to be able to increase your endurance and stamina in order to make it through those tough times. And you have to be healthy. You have to be healthy, you know, and this requires that you have to follow a meal plan, right? In order to increase the odds that the baby is healthy, because if the baby's not healthy, the doctor's going to do what it needs to do to get that baby out, right? And so you can't be loading up daily on McDonald's and Diet Coke when you're pregnant if you're going to be doing the Bradley method. You shouldn't be having Diet Coke anyway if you're pregnant, but you have to eat very healthy in order to have the best outcome for your baby because babies need fruits, babies need vegetables, babies need protein way before they're even born. And moms need it too in order to deliver successfully. However, as natural as birth is, right? You don't go in day one and just have a perfectly natural birth, right? You have to prepare for it. And that's the same way it is in business. You know, you don't wake up one day and have a successful, profitable business, right? You build a successful business, one product, one service, one customer experience at a time. You know, I see so many people, so many entrepreneurs, they run into a fork in the road, right? They run into a fork in the road on their journey. And one day they see that they're short on bills, right? They don't have enough money to pay the bills. They feel like, oh my gosh, payroll is tough right now. and I can't make it through. Perhaps they find that they have to actually borrow from their profit account in order to pay the bill because there's not enough money in the OPEX account, right? And so these entrepreneurs at that fork, they throw in a towel. They say, you know, this is just too hard for me. I can't do this. But the reality is you have to tweak your strategy, right? You have to tweak your strategy and you have to continue to do the profit first transfers no matter what happens, right? You have to keep going in spite of the situation that you're in. And one day what happens is if you keep doing the reps, right? You keep doing the steps, you wake up, you wake up one morning and you're there. You're absolutely there. Now, the target allocation percentage transfers, they happen twice a month, right? They happen on the 10th and 25th of the month. And although you can do them more frequently, and some of you guys are doing them more frequently because of your businesses, if you need to be, you never, ever skip one. You never, ever skip a profit first transfer. And if you find that after you make that profit first transfer, if you still don't have enough money in your OPEX account to make those bills, right? There's still not enough money. Then you adjust your strategy, right? You adjust your strategy. 
and you need to ask yourself, what needs to occur for you to have adequate OPEX to cover your expenses? What has to happen? You know, are you generating a 4X on your labor costs? And I mean, 4X even on your costs, if you were to be hired by your company, are you generating a 4X on that? And if you're not, do you need to increase your prices in order to have that? You know, do you feel like, you know, right now you just don't have enough people to get the work done? Do you feel like you need to have employees? And if so, you know, before you should go out and hire, one of the things I would recommend is you measure the productivity of each of your employees. Is every employee pulling their way? You know, is every employee covering their costs, right? Is every employee bringing in a 4X on costs? And perhaps profit first entrepreneurs, you know, perhaps by holding on to that non-performer, because we all have one, you know, we all have it. Perhaps by holding on to that non-performing employee, right? Perhaps you're blocking your blessings by not being able to open that position to find the right person that can generate that forex. And just because somebody tells you, just because somebody tells you, you know, I'm overwhelmed and this is impossible and I can't do that, right? Just because one of your people say that, you know, sometimes that just means we have the wrong person on the bus right? Maybe it is too hard for them. Maybe this is not their one. And sometimes we just have the wrong person on the bus. You know, I have been there. I've had the wrong person on the bus. And sometimes you just need to try with someone different in order to get that. Now, have you performed a service analysis of your business? So you look at every service offering that you're producing and have you determined that each of the services are producing a 4X on cost? Because sometimes it's not the employee's fault. Sometimes the price that we're selling something at doesn't really justify the resources that we have to allocate to do that service. In this case, what I'm thinking about is those freebies, you know, oh yeah, I'll throw that in for you or or those customer favors, right? I'll just do that this time for you. We've all done it before. And again, sometimes the price doesn't really justify the cost, right? If just if you're throwing in freebies, especially if you're doing favors. And have you audited your services for scope creep? And scope creep for you guys that may not be familiar with that term, that means those extra things that you're just doing, right? meaning that there are services that you're doing today that may not be things that you contracted for. Are you doing services that you don't have a contract for that are not in your engagement letter? Are you doing more than one thing as a favor, right? And I'll be honest with you, somebody is going to pay for that scope creep. Somebody's going to pay for that gift. And if it's not in your engagement letter or contract, it's probably you that's paying for that, right? Because your employees, at the end of the day, they're going to be paid. Whether you're charging for it or not, they're going to be paid. So if you're performing services that are not listed in your engagement letter, perhaps services need to be written into that contract, right? And you need to have that price adjustment for that service that you're offering. And never, ever, ever, whatever you do, skip a target allocation percentage. When you find that you can't make it, when you find that you don't have enough in your OPEX account, that's the failure that's telling you it's time to pivot, right? That's the failure that's saying, you know, this is that learning opportunity. This is the 5,000 time. This is that 5,000 warning that I need to change my direction. So if you're unable to pay your operating expenses, then adjust your strategy. All right, point number three, point number three, get help, get help. You know, do not attempt to do it alone. We've done hundreds of implementations with all types of entrepreneurs. We have seen it all. We have seen the messes. We have seen people like, because, you know, I am beyond the point of no return. We have seen the impossible. Who knows? Maybe the question that you're holding in your head, maybe that's the one that somebody else is struggling with. And maybe someone else is struggling with this. And you having that boldness to ask that question is just the release that person needs to get the help that they need. So don't hold back. Don't hold back. We are here to support you. Okay. So let us do that. Let us support you. Do not hold back. Get the help that you need. So in summary, take pride in the failure. Take pride in the failure. We all do that, right? We all fail. Everybody fails. These great people have all failed to success, right? And fail often, fail often and look for the gift in each failure, then do the reps, do the reps. No one is an overnight success. It's the reps that lead to the outcome that you desire. And then show up for support. Show up support. You don't have to do this alone. We don't want you doing this alone. Show up for support. Now, I hope this was really helpful for you guys. And until next time, may the profits be with you.